as a country, one thing people forget in this modern era is that we've been in a national crisis numerous times, far more than people care to recall. We do remember 9-11, and some of us were around during President Kennedy's assassination. Then there was Abraham Lincoln's assassination 150 years ago. But there's a common theme that's been going on through all of those crises that I think we need to revisit today. And that is about who is actually behind the scene orchestrating these events that we are continually put into. Is it always unique players in new situations? Or is there an underlying theme and a common group of perpetrators with these crimes against America and the world? Is there any organization of people trying to keep us enslaved? Now, if you go back to the origins of our country, there were people who came to this continent and set up colonies, growing the population until it was eventually large enough that local jurisdictions were needed to manage and maintain the organization of streets, taxes, tariffs, property ownership, etc. Then came the creation of a constitutional government from groups of states aligned and working together. But immediately upon signing the Declaration of Independence, that federal system we established, called the United States of America, essentially needed to declare war against its motherland of England and the ruler, King George. We decided we were no longer going to be ruled from afar by foreign masters. We were not going to be their slaves here, helping to keep them prosperous there. So, we declared our independence and had the Revolutionary War that went on for a very long time, much longer than most people realize. Through the course of many battles, people were forced to pick a side. The willingness to go against England and King George was not universal from the outset. On numerous occasions, strategies and tactics were compromised by infiltrators and turncoats on both sides. But over time, people's true nature and alliances were revealed, just as is playing out once again before us today. Even some of those closest to President Washington became traitors against him and our newly formed country for the gains they would earn from their British partners. And even after we won the Revolutionary War, when the Brits had retreated, we then needed to win a second war against England. The War of 1812 was foisted upon us by people trying to get control of America again through our money and banking systems. That was a very extensive battle and bad situation that we had to again fight our way out of. By most accounts, it was a banker's war to gain control of our banking and monetary systems. They wanted to control our currency. Even though the Constitution would only allow for our own government to create our money. As we move forward in time, what happened during Abraham Lincoln's presidency? Early on in his administration, and instigated by monarchy agents out of Europe, a rift was accentuated between the northern and southern U.S. With that, another variation of the same old bankers' wars was created. In order to get money to fight that war, Lincoln needed loans from the European banks that held monarchy money, the bloodline family's money. Those 13 bloodline families were represented in the colonies that had to pursue funds to fight this war against the South. But the bankers wanted 24% to 36% interest. So Lincoln declined that extortion and used his presidential powers to issue interest-free money, having no indebtedness to foreign bankers. This currency was based on the good faith and credit of the American people and their government. It was not backed with silver or gold, but worked for all debts, whether public with government entities or private individuals and their businesses. With green printing on the back, that money Lincoln issued became known as greenbacks, which is where we get that same term used today. One of the interesting things about those greenbacks is that they were hated by the foreign banks. In fact, 
I want to give you part of an article from the London Times that came out after President Lincoln issued that American-owned currency. Quote, If that mischievous financial policy, which had its origins in the North America Republic, should become indurated, established, down to a fixture, then that government will furnish its own money without cost. It will pay off debts and be without debt. It will have all the money necessary to carry on its commerce. It will become prosperous beyond precedent in the history of the civilized governments of the world. The brains and the wealth of all countries will go to North America. That government must be destroyed or it will destroy every monarchy on the globe." Unquote. The bankers obviously got it. Those 13 royal bloodline families of which the Rothschilds sit at the head of the table there in the city of London understood that the only real threats to their power are sovereign governments like ours that are able to print their interest-free and debt-free paper money. Those bankers knew it would break the power over people in the U.S. and then spread to the rest of the world. Think about what Lincoln did there, after which he also fought the Civil War and won. A decade after that war ended, greenbacks had become worth as much as gold and had even been moved higher. So today, people are wondering how well we're going to do as a country. As I gave this presentation on Patriot Productions' social media channel on April 15th of 2020, not many noticed what happened with the financial institutions during this recent COVID-19 event. President Trump moved the private banking cartels Federal Reserve Bank under U.S. Treasury Authority, where the Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, is answerable only to the President of the United States. Let's think about this. You remember those bankers in Lincoln's time when he started our own currency. They felt they had to come back at him. They needed to get him as payback and retaliation for daring to print our own currency and not pay them interest. And in the big picture, understand this. The only place on our planet where the Queen of England or whatever reigning monarch is on the throne in England has to annually present him or herself in front of and bow or curtsy to is the mayor of the city of London. Why? It's because of the power behind the throne, which is the real money behind all the royal bloodline families. It's these people that consider themselves to be descendants of the biblical Cain, who was the first born of mankind and its first murderer. They are these kings who presume to rule by what they feel is their blood right. These people who get their power by working as a team to control all the governments of the world by domination of the planet's money. And it's all done out of the city of London. Annually, the Queen of England has to present herself to the mayor of the city of London and does so with her shoes off. She curtsies and defers to that mayor's authority, which comes from the bankers. And it's because that mayor runs a city-state, the city of London, which is not a part of England, but is on its own sovereign territory, just as are the city-states of the Vatican and Washington, D.C. During the Kennedy administration, President Kennedy had a similar situation. He also realized what was going on with these people. So he set out to create our own currency that would again be interest-free money. Remember this very telling admission from Meyer Amschel Rothschild. Quote, Permit me to issue and control the money of a nation, and I care not who makes its laws. Unquote. When Kennedy came into office, he was fighting these monsters who were really destroying the United States. They created wars and pushed us into all kinds of other efforts we didn't want to take on. And that's because they have always manipulated us in their pursuit of making money from us. 
constantly keeping us in battles they'd like, using our citizens and the American military against other lands. They instigate and push wars all over the planet with use of Americans and our military might, as if we're a branch office of their secret service spy agencies around the world. After the Bay of Pigs and various other events that President Kennedy either dealt with or witnessed, he came up with a solution. On June 4th of 1963, he signed Executive Order 11110, which is an interesting number because World War I ended in the 11th month, on the 11th day, and at the 11th hour of the day. That is precisely when those in control stopped the war. Why? It's because of the numerology. 11, 11, 11 is symbolic for them. President Kennedy, being knowledgeable about their codes and numbers, sent them a little coded message with 11s. It said, quote, hey, we're going to stop your wars, unquote. It was Kennedy's answer to World War I and World War II, as well as a message for those trying to get us into World War III and running our country's finances that executive order gave President Kennedy the legal authority to create money that was interest and debt free. Currency belonging only to the American people. It was just what Lincoln had done with his greenbacks. Kennedy had those notes printed, blatantly ignoring the Federal Reserve notes from the private banks. Even today, Many Americans don't understand that the Federal Reserve and the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, are no more federal than Federal Express. They are administrated by federal employees, but as the U.S. courts have shown, the IRS is a Puerto Rican corporation. And of course, there is nothing in the Federal Registry identifying an income tax, which is because it's voluntary. Each year, we Americans voluntarily assess for ourselves a certain amount we supposedly owe. Of course, at the end of the day, it's enforced using the statutes regarding liquor, tobacco, and firearms, just as though it is a mandatory tax. And the courts, as well as the rest of our legal system, have gone along with it. In fact, months before 9-11 happened in 2001, Congress had scheduled hearings for October of 2001 to look into the legality of the IRS and the way laws surrounding it have been enforced. But those hearings never happened because of 9-11. So, repeatedly over time, we've had incidents occur that changed the course of the country. And April seems to be an appealing month for their events. They kind of enjoy making their things happen in April. Why is that? Well, most of us probably don't realize that the Gregorian, Julian, and other calendars that have been put forth over time for us to use are not the same calendar used by those people we are engaged against. These royal and banking families actually go by the Babylonian calendar. And with that... By their marking of time, the beginning of the new millennium for the Babylonian group, a thousand-year period of the new world they want to see created, occurred in the spring of 2012. We just ended the seventh year and the beginning of the eighth of the new millennium for these Babylonians. And eight is their number of the new day. It's the number of Horus or the rising sun having to do with the pagan festival of Ishtar, Easter. To them, 2020 is just beginning year eight, the new day, and they wanted to get it off to a good start. <laughs>